Because when somebody says that with sincerity, this is the big thing. This is the really big thing. Maybe you don't see it move mountains and shake the earth and cause tidal waves and tsunamis. But that's really what's happening. Ash hadu. An la ilaha illallah. I bear witness here and now, right here in Dubai, that there is nothing worthy of my worship except one God without any partners. And that Muhammad is his last and his final servant, slave, and messenger. Allah Akbar. We'll take a question from the sister side, but just before you start, just like to know how many non-Muslim guests do we have? If you could just please put your hands up. Don't be scared. Sheikh Yusuf doesn't bite. Okay. I would encourage our guests to, you know, come forward and ask some questions if you feel comfortable. Yeah, if we have any of our guests with us today, and first of all, we welcome you very much. And we appreciate your courage to come out here with all these terrorists. Oh, Muslims! <laughs> that bomb class is tomorrow night, right? <laughs> you know what? They say you can only see it once. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, uh, we would really like to have your questions because this gives us an opportunity to see where you're coming from and it gives you a chance to explore and find out what some of the answers are to the concerns. Usually, the questions that I get most from the universities where I visit I deal with the subject of the treatment of people. What is the treatment of non-Muslims? What's the treatment of women? What is the treatment uh, of subjects like in war and things like that? So, if you don't mind, I'd like to answer the question you didn't ask, but I'll throw it out there for you. And that is, what does Islam say about the way we treat others? Well, first of all, God Almighty makes it very, very clear with a word in the Arabiya. It's zulm. Zulm. Allah says He never does zulm. God never does zulm. And He forbids us to do it. And that's uh, usually translated to English as aggressive or transgressive oppression. And certainly terrorism is one of those that fits under that category. So we are commanded in the Quran to fight against any form of munkar. And munkar is again a, a large umbrella underneath which you will also find acts of aggression and terrorism. We find in the Quran clearly an order for the Muslims to aggressively go out and fight against acts that you would describe as terrorism, which under another general uh, term are used in Arabic, fitna. And fight against fitna until Allah's deen can, I think we'll translate it as, um, can be openly displayed. It's very clear. And if you understand that, you can see that the only time that Muslims are allowed to engage in active combat is in the support of what Islam teaches and to prevent that teaching from being destroyed. But never as the aggressor to go in and take away other people's rights because that would be an exact contradiction to the meaning. You cannot violate people's rights. Human rights in Islam is one of the big attractions that I have found after I got into Islam. And it still interests me very much 20 years later to see so many of the things that we have today that we're so proud of in the West. But Islam came with that long ago. Long before the Geneva Convention. <laughs> Actually long before there was a place called Geneva. Islam is coming with some very beautiful teachings. For instance, how do you treat your enemies? Now, in a sense, we find that in the New Testament that you should be, you know, even kind to your enemies. But not in the sense that Islam clearly spells it out. When you've captured people that were trying to kill you, 
You captured them. You got them right now. You cannot abuse them. You can't chop off their body parts. Can't kill them. Can't stand them up on a box with a hood over their head and two wires hooked to their fingers. And I didn't mean anything by that. <laughs> or did I? <laughs> so the things that we see being violated today by some countries against the Geneva Convention long ago were forbidden for Muslims to do. Look at this. In general. Leave the enemy subject alone for a minute. Just talk about in general. Your neighbor. Our prophet, peace be upon him, said he's not a believer who fills his stomach up and goes to sleep at night well, his neighbor's stomach remains empty. And that's kind of scary when you consider how much food we eat every day. That's kind of scary when you consider that how many neighbors we have. So the companions and followers of Muhammad, they ask him, well, who is my neighbor? He said, 40 in any direction. For sure, that's one of the sunnas or the ways of Muhammad that most of us have left off. We really have. We don't really concern ourselves about our neighbors like we used to. And I hope that we'll come back to that. I mean, another thing about the treatment of people in Islam is the responsibility that we have to share this message with them. Not to proselytize. No. Not to convert. No. But to share the information in a way they can understand it and make it easy for them to know, understand, and if they like, to accept this message of believing in one God and doing what he wants you to do. And of course, that's the area that I try to work in every day. But again, this is something that we've forgotten about. We say, okay, hey, I'm a Muslim, and you're a Hindu, or you're a whatever. And that wasn't how that was intended at all. That verse that says to you your way and me my way was when people are coming to make fun of you, to attack you, to basically hurt your feelings. Okay, you deliver a message. And if they don't like it, okay, then, then it's when you tell them, you worship what you worship, I'll worship what I worship, you know. And if you, you don't want what we got, okay, we don't want that either, so have a nice day. Go worship your toys or whatever you want to do. The treatment now, in, I want to get more specific, the treatment of your relatives. How important is it for a man to treat his wife in a good way? And again, if you said, well, I know Muslims that don't treat their wives very good, well, <laughs> for sure he's going, to get, he's going to be charged for that on the Day of Judgment, without a doubt. But the lady in Islam is clearly giving some very big rights that they never had before the Quran was revealed. Because the verse starts out with the word rajul. Rajul is male. Males. This is in chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran on Nisa. And here's where Allah said the males have the responsibility over the females. And he said it like this because Allah, he gave the one power that he didn't give to the other one. So you got the power, you got the muscle, get out there and get it to work. And bring it home. And how many of us forget this? In Islam, the man is responsible for the house. Who makes the house? Payments? If you're renting a house or who has to buy the house? Who? The man. Utilities, hmm? food, clothing, medical, education. Who's responsible to take care of the lady and make sure she has all these things? This is in the Quran. Who? Males. So how much, suppose the lady has some wealth, maybe she inherited it, maybe she has a career, whatever. 
What percentage should she pay? And this was asked to me by a dear friend of mine one time. What percentage should my wife be paying out of her salary for our place where we live? And when I said zero, he looked at me like, huh? You know, she quit her job just right after that. <laughs> True story. But that's the beautiful thing that a lot of women, they don't realize. Islam has given her the thing she'd always wanted. You know, what's mine is mine, and <laughs> what yours is mine too. <laughs> and what about the treatment of the parents? We spoke about that a minute ago, about the children enslaving their parents. Look at this one. Now keep in mind, at the time this came, in the Arab desert, a woman was like the lowest scum that there was to these men. They treated them terrible. There was no limit on how many wives a guy could have. There was no limit on the way that he could treat her either. He could beat them up. He could kick them around. Nobody said anything. And the worst of all, many of them would take a newborn daughter to the desert and bury her alive in a burning sand. And consider that macho. One of the very first things that Islam was dealing with after the correct belief was to stop this practice of mistreating women. And when we talk about rights, I want to wrap this answer up with this statement from the Prophet, peace be upon him. When we talk about rights, a man came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and said, after Allah's rights, I mean, you know, Allah has the right to be worshipped alone, without partners, and the Prophet has the right to be followed, as opposed to following Obama or somebody else. Follow your prophet. So after Allah and his messenger, who has the first rights on me? The most rights on me. What did he say? Ladies? I knew the ladies knew this one. <laughs> nice and loud. Remember, you don't have microphones. You're on TV. Let's see it again. After Allah and his messenger, who has the most rights on me? Mother. Your mother. And then who? Mother. Your mother. And then who? Your mother and then? Father. Maybe your father. No, it is his father. <laughs> so this was something really strange. This saying coming from him was like, huh? What? Women have rights? My mother, my mother, my mother. Why is this emphasis coming like this? And sure enough, the women were finally freed from a very oppressive regime. I wanted to use that word in a sentence tonight. Nothing to do with recent events in Egypt or something like that. So I think that uh, that's a very good question and certainly something that I encourage all non-Muslims, if you don't know a lot about Islam, look for what is human rights in Islam. And if you start reading where people are chopping off hands and fingers and heads and necks and all the rest of it, uh, check another website. Maybe, just maybe, there's a little uh, something askew on that answer. Thank you for the question. On the sister's side, we have a... Assalamu alaikum. Sorry. Wa alaikum salam rahmatullah. Go ahead, sister. We have a sister over here who would like to take her shahada. MashaAllah. Now we're cooking. For that, I'm going to get up. We have... Uh, you said we have a lady that's ready to accept Islam. Yes. Yes? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, what's your name? My name is Vanessa. Vanessa. Yes. Okay, has anybody explained to you that the most important thing in Islam is we believe there's only one God and he has no partners. Did you understand that? Yeah. Many people, uh, many sisters told me about that. Okay. And we believe that Muhammad is the last messenger, but we also believe in all the other messengers as well. Did they explain that? Yeah, they did. Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, and for sure Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they explained all of that. They are just messengers, I mean, um, uh, prophets. As prophets, right. Yeah. This, is, this is very important, and we believe in them as prophets. 
not gods or sons of gods. Okay, so, and you're ready now to begin to live the life of a Muslim, trying your best to obey what Almighty Allah wants you to do? Yes, I'm totally ready. Totally ready, okay. <laughs> All right, then uh, you want to do it in English first, and then inshallah, God willing, we'll do it in the Arabic language. We're Texas Arabic, but it'll be close. Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, just repeat after me. I swear. I swear. There's no God to worship. There's no God to worship. Except one God. Except one God. Allah. Allah. And I swear. And I swear. Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. And now, inshallah, we'll do the Arabic. I'll go slow and just repeat what you hear. Ash hadu. Ash hadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa. Wa. Ash hadu. Ash hadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Mashallah. MashaAllah, Allahu Akbar. Now, thank you, brother. You did a good job on that, and we're real proud of you. I think I should mention to you, and I'm sure they'll tell you, but for the record, when anybody enters into Islam in sincerity, on that point and at that time, in that place, Allah removes every single sin that they ever committed. So this means you're just like when you came forth out of your mother. It means you have no sins at all. You're like newborn. And this was the expression used in the past by other prophets, explaining to people when you accept this, you'll be like newborn. So you're newborn in Islam, this means you didn't convert actually, you reverted because this is the natural state of a child when they're born as well. Innocent, without sin, and certainly, inshallah, God willing, still lots of good deeds that you have, because Allah took away only the bad ones, and purified all your other deeds, your actions, and now you have all of that working for you. There's another bonus that goes with this, and that is that you now have direct connect. Direct connect and you're not going to have to worry about running out of minutes or the battery going dead. Because Allah is always ready to take your dua, your petition to Him, your prayers to Him. All you have to do is ask Him in, in your heart and He's going to accept that. And on top of that, you have another thing that really helps charge your batteries up. He wants you to do this five times a day. And it's called in Arabic, Salah. And Salah related to another word in Arabic which means connection. So this is, inshallah, your connection with God. You want to keep that up every day. They'll help you with that. Sisters will explain it to you. But there's another area that I need to warn you about. Because you just said, I believe. Allah tells us in chapter 29, verses 2 and 3 of the Quran, Surah Ankabut. Do the people think they're going to be left alone just because they said, I believe? And they're not going to be put into a big calamity or fitna? Just as I put the people before them, he's, uh, this is a law talking, he's saying just as the people before them were put into this big calamities, and so this is to show who are the real truthful and who are the liars. So even though you're going to be tested, even though you're going to experience some difficulty, I want you to remember this is just from a law, and you need to be patient. And remember this, usri yusra. In the mouth, those three yusra. Verily, after difficulty comes the ease. For sure, for sure, for sure. After any difficulty, Allah will bring ease. So be patient with the tests that Allah gives you. And finally, this one little piece of advice and kind of a notification, really. The biggest fitna or difficulty that most new Muslims receive is other Muslims. <laughs> so we're sorry about that in advance. But that's the reality. That's what you're up against. While we're on this subject of people accepting Islam, is there anybody else that feels like this is a good time for them to say Shahada? If we have somebody else that feels strong, you want to do that? Okay, if you'd like to go over to the microphone, go ahead. The 
if anybody else would like to join him, do we have uh, some others, some sisters here, brothers over here, anybody else? How about this? Some of us, uh, we claim we're Muslim because we got the name Muhammad, Abdullah, but maybe, uh, you know what I'm saying, maybe this a lot been a little bit weak for the past 20 years. <laughs> and some things are kind of missing and you'd feel kind of good about uh, making your shahada. I want you to think about that real serious while we help our brother here. Now tell us your name, brother. Uh, my name is Angel. Angel? Yes, sir. Angel uh, from Philippines. I like that, actually. <laughs> You don't have any wings, do you? <laughs> okay, that's cool. Did anybody explain to you about our belief as Muslim? We believe there's really only one God. Yes. Of Adam. Yes. The God of Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, Jesus yes. Christ, peace be upon And also Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes. And also that we have, and I didn't mention that for the sister, but I'll mention it to you. We have six areas of things that we believe in. First of all, we believe in the law. And we believe in the angels. And we believe in the books. All of the books came from Allah. We believe that, although we don't accept if they're translated, okay? So the original books that came from Allah. And we believe in all of these prophets who came as real prophets of God. And then we believe in the day of resurrection that all people will be brought back on the day of judgment. Along with that, we also believe in the cutter or predestination, that everything is under Allah's control. He never loses control. It's always there. He's got this control yes. over everything. So have they explained that to you? Yes, sir. And you're ready to accept that? Yes, I accept it already before. Okay. Now, is the gentleman right behind you there, is he ready to accept it? Tell us your name. He's uh, my brother. Huh? My brother. Your brother, what's his name? Bas. Bas. Bas? Bas? Yes. Bas. Bas. B-A-S? Yes. B. B-A-S. We Arabs can't say that letter. B-A-S. <laughs> Beast be upon you. <laughs> Bas. Yeah. Peace, peace, peace and angel. Peace. Uh, your parents had something in mind for you from the beginning, guys. You're in good shape. <laughs> peace and angel. MashaAllah. Okay. Are we ready? Yes, we're ready. English first. I swear. Both of you at the same time. I swear. I swear. I swear. There's no God to worship. There's, There's no, no God, God to, to worship. worship. Except one God. Except, Except one God. God. Allah. 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 And I swear. And I, I swear, swear, Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. Ashhadu. 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 An la ilaha. An la ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. By the way, when this is all over with, guys, keep your eye on these fellas here. Because you're going to want to do a lot of hugging. You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, brothers, not the girls. <laughs> Come on. No? Where you get these guys? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Do I have anybody else who is accepting this notion that we just were talking about, that there really is one God, and we need to do what he wants us to do on his terms, according to the way we learned it from Muhammad. Anybody else like to do that now? You remember what I said, the hardest thing for me to do was to admit I was wrong. Don't let that be the thing that stops you from getting to paradise. If you feel like you need to do your shahada, don't let this intimidate you. Do it. Nobody knows if they'll even wake up in the morning. So that's, that's really an important consideration. Keep that in mind. Okay, do we have any other questions? We do. We have one. Yes. The sister side. Question? Yeah, there is another question from the sister side. I'm just... Uh telling it on behalf of the sister. Um, she's, a, she's a French lady, she's our sister in humanity, and she would like to ask, how do I believe in God? 
she was a Christian before, but um, she has been raised uh, by her parents as a Christian, but she's not a Christian since the last five years, according to her. And uh, she would like to know, how can she again believe in God? I want to tell you what happened to me and see if this makes sense to you. Even though I was exploring two religions at the same time, the one I grew up with, with Christianity and Islam, there were also other things running through my mind that I had encountered, books, people that I met, ideas and concepts from professors down the line. And all of that was going through my mind pretty much at the same time. And I was sharing this with the Muslim who I was trying to convert. I had just witnessed what you just witnessed tonight. I had just witnessed a Catholic priest accepting Islam and was shocked. How could this man who devoted his whole life, his career, everything he knows, everything he is all about, he just gave it up to go to Islam. And I had just had a dialogue with my wife about that subject and discovered she also was interested to be a Muslim. And I still had trouble saying it. I had trouble. To the extent that while I was telling her, she said, I want to get a divorce. I said, what? She said, yeah, a Muslim can't be married to a Christian. I said, whoa, I didn't say I want to be one of them Muslim guys. Don't worry about it. Besides, he told us that a Muslim lady couldn't be married to a Christian man. She said, that's what I'm talking about. I want to be a Muslim. <clears throat> okay. All right, all right, hold on. Okay, I'll be a Muslim too. She said, I don't believe you. Why? Well, you're lying. You're just saying it. Because a minute ago you said you wouldn't be one. Now you say you will. Either way, you're a liar. Then or now. Either way. Uh-uh. Then she told me, get out. I was halfway down the stairs when I realized, you know, I just got kicked out of my own father's house. <laughs> It hit me hard, and I went and woke up the Muslim. He stayed with us, you know. And I said, I gotta talk to you. So we were talking, and your subject that you're asking about came up. After all of the rest of what we talked about, how do I know? And look what he told me. He said, This is not an issue, really, about you and the priest, or you and your wife, or you and your father, or you and me. This is an issue between you and your Lord. The one you need to be talking to is him. And he walked off and left me standing there. And that's when I decided, you know what? I'm going to do something really big here. I'm going to face myself in the same direction he did. Put my head on the ground the way I saw him do it. And then figure out what to do next. And with my head on the ground... And I guess by now you figured out I don't have trouble articulating ad infinitum. I have no problem talking, okay? But on that occasion, I couldn't say anything. Nothing. Because I was looking in my heart for what do I really want to say? What do I really, really want to say? And the only words that came out of my mouth were, Oh God, guide me. And if you'll do that, then from there on you'll be all right. Because if you're sincere, and if there's a God, who else is going to guide you? And that's what Islam teaches us. It's as simple as that. You know for a fact that you exist. How did you get here? You know for a fact there's a universe out there, and you know that it didn't come about all by itself. How did it all happen? And if you haven't had a chance yet to study this book in any language, it's now in French as far as I know, you can take a chance to look through the translations of the Quran. 
I think you'll find, if you're serious about it, I think you'll find the guidance there. Because there's a condition, actually a couple of conditions when you read it. It starts out with a seven verse prayer. But right after that, the biggest chapter of the Quran comes. And it says these words like this. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alif lam mim. Laliku kitab Allah rayb fi. Hulil lil muttaqin. Alladhina yukminun bil ghaybi wa yukimun salata wa mimma razaqanahum yunfikun. Walladhina yukminun bima unzil ilayhi. Wama unzil min kabli. وَبِالْآخِرَتِهُمْ يُوْكِنُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ لَا هُدًا مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ مُفْتِهُمْ This is the key. The mufta is right there. Because in the verses before, the seven verses I mentioned to you, it contains the statement that I said. اَدِينَ سُرَاتُ الْمُسْتِكِينَ Guide us. Guide us to the straight path. Anybody in this room right now, I challenge you. I challenge you. To say that in your heart. Don't, don't even move your lips. But in your heart. If you have any doubt about who, there being a God. Or who God is. Just say this in your heart. Oh God guide us. Guide us. Edina Surat al-Mustakim. And then it's up to him. Isn't it? All up to him. The meaning of the verse that I read to you. It's an answer to your prayer. You just ask to be guided. It said, this, actually it says that, Dalek, that. That is the book wherein there is no doubt a guidance for those who have a taqwa. And they believe in al ghaib the unseen. They establish regular worship. And they give out of the provision that Allah gives them in charity to help the poor. The impoverished. And they believe. They believe in the law. They believe in what's been sent down to you, meaning Muhammad. And they believe in what was sent down before. And they believe in the day of judgment, the Akhirah. And these are the people, these are the people who are really the successful. These are the people who are on the true guidance of Almighty God. So if you want to be guided, and you just ask to be guided, this is the way. The way, number one, and I left this in Arabic language for you. You better have taqwa, or else it won't work. What is taqwa? The translations usually say righteousness, piousness, good guy, you know, stuff like that. Well, the reality is that this word means a partition, a hijab, a barrier, a shield. Why would I need a shield? What's that for? It's a shield between you and something from Allah. And if you said, wait a minute, how could I protect myself against my creator? Well, you can't, but you can protect yourself from one of the things that's going to happen. And that's the evidence of his anger on the day of judgment and that shield will protect you and what is that shield a taqwa to have this god consciousness in all that you do try your best to live a good life according to what god says it is not according to what you think it is or somebody else thinks but what he is telling you try your best that's your shield and that's how to get guided Simple as that. So I'll pray for you and ask Allah to guide you and hope that you'll find what you're looking for. I mean, yeah. anybody else? <coughs> yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf, it's, uh, first of all, I'd like to say how, um, how much of a pleasure it is to have you here in Dubai. Um, and I'll try to keep my questions uh, short and, and easy for you. Uh, I'd like to pass on a couple of questions that I constantly get from uh, my non-Muslim friends. Uh, let's say, first of all, uh, why should women cover up? As, uh, as, you know, as short and plain and simple as that. Why is it? What's the purpose? Um, 
what good comes to the society from women covering up. So this is the first one. The second one is, um, I get some of my non-Muslim friends saying that they think it's demeaning for women to be, have to, to be a responsibility of a male in her life throughout her life. First of all, she's responsible, she's the responsibility of, of her father, then the responsibility of her husband. If she has no husband, she's the responsibility of her brother, her son perhaps, later on in life. And some people say that they think it's demeaning for women. So, what are your comments on that? Just one second, Shane, before you start. It's your private if you take questions. Please keep the questions on topic again, and just one question at a time, please. Sheikh, if you want to answer, it's up to you. Esmaq? My name is Diyak. 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 Diyak al-Din. The gardens of the religion? Uh, actually, Diyak is synonymous with Noor. Oh, know, oh, like oh. Diyak. I thought you said Riyab. No, no, Diyak. Shaklaf here, light of the Deen. Like Noor al-Din. MashaAllah. Where are you from, Aki? Uh, Egypt. Antman Mesk. Yeah, we figured that. Anta Saidi. That's okay. That's okay. No problem. It's uh, you know, it's it, you know, it's it's not uh, it's not an insult, but uh, I'm not. I don't look even Saidi. Zakalak here, Habibi. First is Saida. There were two questions that our brother asked us about, related to the, our sisters. The first question is, uh, I think, probably one of the most obvious in the whole world. But it came to me the first time that, that somebody hit me with it was a lady. She was a professor in the university where I was giving a talk. And she didn't hear any of what I said. She just had walked in the door at a particular moment during the question and answer period. And with no microphone or anything, she just walked in the middle of the room and pointed at the ladies, pointed at our sisters, and she said, why are they dressed like that? <laughs> oh, I couldn't believe she did that, you know? I said, excuse me? Why are they dressed like that? And then I realized I'm on my own, you know? Because I don't have anything that really, that I'd ever studied that said how to answer a question that way. So I trust the law. And I said, Tawakal to Allah. Allah, give me the answer. What came in my mind, and this is what I do all the time anyway, I just take what comes in my mind, and hopefully Allah will accept that. Because when we start, we say, Bismillah, we hope it's going to be from Allah, right? So, said, excuse me, ma'am, but what's wrong with the way they're dressed? I want to know why they're dressed like that. I said, what's the matter with that? Is it something you don't like? Yes! I said, it doesn't fit your logic. That's right. It's not logical. Good. So then my question is easy. Now, for you, why are you dressed at all? <laughs> what? I said, why are you dressed at all? I beg your pardon. It's not nice to beg, but <laughs> I'm asking you, why are you wearing any clothes? Because according to logic, you were born without any clothes, right? You didn't have any clothes on when you came into the world. You were naked in the buff, nude, right? So why are you wearing any clothes at all? She lost it right there. And really high-pitched scream. Modesty! Ah. Now ask the ladies with the covering on why they're dressed like that. They'll give you the exact same answer. There's no difference. They will say the word you said, modesty. The difference is you decided what modesty was when you put your clothes on this morning. And by the way, she was covered all the way to her wrist and all the way to her ankles. She was, strangely enough. I said, you decided what was modesty when you got dressed. These ladies let their Lord and Creator tell them what modesty was. That's the difference. Next question. Boom. The next question we have now that our brother's asking us about is the role of the woman. And the way the question's presented, 
even should give it away before we come to the idea of this demeaning word that he kept throwing in there. This is an offer. It's a commandment on the men to take care of the women. But if for whatever reason she doesn't want it, well, duh! Can a woman file for divorce, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Oh, well, what's your next question? If she doesn't want to be married to somebody, then what? If she doesn't want someone to care for her, love her, make her the queen of the house, if she doesn't want to have an easy way to go when it comes to a lot of the things that many women in the street would love to have from a Muslim man, then it's her choice. There's nothing in Islam forcing women to enjoy the benefits. <laughs> Next question. Right. Sisters in the middle. Sisters in the middle. Yeah. Oh yes, we have a sister. Salam alaikum, sister. Salam alaikum. It's an honor to be talking to you right now, sir. My name is Sundas and I'm currently a student and uh, I study with lots of non-Muslims and uh, I'm faced many times with the question, if there's a God, why are there bad things in this world? I love that question. <laughs> I love that question. You know why I love that question? Because I used to have the same question. And anything and everything I looked at never answered that question until I came to Islam. That for me is one of the clearest proofs. If you really want to use your brain and think about what's going on around you and think about religion and a belief pattern or system, really you need to look at Islam. You really need to look at it because it's the only one that gives you the answer. Because Islam never demands from you blind faith. Never. The only thing we are told in Islam, the only restriction... Don't try to imagine what Allah is like. Don't imagine what Allah looks like. Don't get into that area because you can't. You'll, dis dis you'll destroy your own brain. Other than that, ask. And on our website, watch out, here comes a commercial. On our website, islamnewsroom.com, we have that article featured more times maybe than almost anything else. If there's a God... Why all of this chaos in the world? And that's our subject today, isn't it? All this chaos in the world. Tornadoes. Earthquakes. We have an earthquake page on that same website. All about earthquakes. It updates every few minutes. You can see where the earthquakes are right now. And they have increased in intensity, just like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said they would. Tremendous number of earthquakes today. Several hundred earthquakes have happened since I've been giving you this speech right now. Go there and check it out. Along with that, pestilence, violence, wars, occupations. And I'm not talking about jobs. <laughs> and family abuse. Serious problems. We even talked about a few of them, didn't we? Serious stuff. So if there's a gun, why is all that stuff happening? It means the person asking the question doesn't even have the basic understanding of what Islam taught. Islam never taught us that this was the Jannah. Huh. What? You thought you were in paradise? Is that what you thought? Look what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. He summed it up with one of the simplest, most beautiful little teachings you could ever imagine. When it comes to why do bad things happen to good people, that's how I titled the, the lecture about this originally years ago. Prophet Wasallam he said, Adunya sijnu mu'min wa genital kafir. This material existence that we're in called Hayat dunya, life of this world, 
is a prison to a true believer. But it's the only paradise to a disbeliever. He narrowed it down to two things. Believers and disbelievers. We know as believers that this is the hardest thing we're going to go through. Because when this is over, that's it. It's done. It's done. You're not going to be put in any more tests. But you start seeing the results of the tests. You know how that goes. But for the disbeliever, this is their paradise. And that's why they want so desperately to build the big things here. And the fancy cars. The beautiful homes. The best of clothes. You know what I'm saying? You know, strut your stuff, baby. Okay. <laughs> this is what they're looking for. But our Prophet Wasallam, he told us, and this is another hadith, to clarify it even more. Because some of the companions were concerned about the same thing that you're concerned about with your question. He said two people would be brought on the day of judgment. One of them, he had everything he asked for in this life. Even to the extent when he was dying, he wanted a feast set before him and he got it. The other person, he didn't get anything he asked for. Even to the extent when he was about to die, all he asked for was just a drink of water. And he didn't even get that. Now on the day of judgment, the one who had everything, he would be pushed into the hell fire. Like you put a needle in something and pull it out. Just in that instant. Whoop, whoop. And then, it's not in the Hadith. That whoop, whoop, is not there. <laughs> Don't look for that. He would be asked, in your whole life, remember he had everything, in your whole life, did you ever see any good? He'd say, well, what? in my whole life I never saw anything good. It wiped it all out. The other man that had nothing, suffered in this life, would be put into paradise. <laughs> like you put a pin in something and pull it out. And then he would be asked, in your whole life, did you ever see anything bad? He would say, well, why? In my whole life, I never saw anything bad. No hardships. So the companions, still not quite satisfied with that one, they said, yeah, but, okay, so why this guy who had everything has to go to hell and why the other guy goes to paradise? Oh. And Prophet Sassan made it real clear. Nobody's perfect. Well, yeah, duh. I'm one of those not perfect guys. He said that nobody is perfectly good and nobody's perfectly bad. The man who had everything in this life, actually he was a very bad person. Allah hated him. So we don't have that concept, by the way. God is love and he loves everything and everybody, no matter how bad they are. No, 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 no. We know that God is the loving al-wadud and ready to love anything and everything that is good, but he's also capable of well, dealing it out heavy duty, and you don't want to know about that. So this man, who Allah hated, who had done so many monstrously bad things to people, yet he did some good deeds. So Allah paid him in this life for his good deeds. So he would not even smell the paradise. That he could be thrown directly, right straight into hell. The other man, this gentleman, actually was very good. And Allah loved him. But he did some bad things. He made some mistakes. But because Allah doesn't want him to even smell the hellfire, not even for a nanosecond, so Allah let him have his punishment here, in this dunya, so that he could go straight into the paradise. Stop and think about it. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't there really need to be a, a day of judgment? Because otherwise, how could any of us look at the things that are going on around us again and again and again and see how the tyrants and the aggressors and the oppressors 
throughout history again and again and again. Not only do they win these battles and wars, but they go away with all the spoils of wars. Well, the really good people, the honest, kind, giving, generous, charity giving people are suffering. Literally starving to death. But that's because this is a dunya. How many of you know what the word dunya really means? Raise your hand. You really know where it comes from? What's the source? Ah, something really low. Really low in a base. Something so disgusting, right? Somebody would go, oh man, I've got dunya on my shoe. <laughs> low. And that's what this universe is to Allah. How low? And again, we don't say, for Allah so loved the world. We don't have that. That's not our concept. Why do these people get these big this and big that and oh, 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 you see people of the West doing so and so and so. Muslims out here just, you know, for food, trying their best, right? But look at this. Prophet Sassam said it to his companions so they'd understand. If the universe and everything in it, hayat the dunya wa ma fiha, everything in this universe was even worth a wing, a wing of a mosquito to Allah, then he would never give those bad people a sip of water to drink. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now we understand, this is not our paradise. This is our chance to earn paradise, work for paradise, and get the mercy of Allah so we can go to paradise. Well, this is not our paradise. So when you see the bad things happening to the people here, just remember, the ones who are suffering the most here have the best chance to go to paradise. And those who have everything here, they have the least chance. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it sure ruins your opportunities. So this is why Muslims are constantly encouraging each other to whatever you do, do it with a good intention for the sake of others. Now, some people will say, oh, wow, look the look way they spent their money. Last night we were down in Abu Dhabi. Have you seen the big masjid down there? That's an amazing place. And the people could say, oh, wow, look, they wasted their money. How do you say that? Why would you say that? How many people go there? Even tourists go there and want to know about it. They learn about Islam. And it's a big place to worship. How many of you have been there? Were you impressed? Yes or no? You were impressed with something big. It's amazing. By the way, it must be pretty impressive. I didn't even say the name of it. You know which one I meant, didn't you? Huh? So see, when Muslims do something, at least they put a good intention with it. Something, hopefully, that Allah will accept. And we know we make mistakes along the way. But at least, inshallah, God can forgive us. Because we never made partners with Him in our worship. And what did Allah say about that? You didn't ask this question, but I'd like to throw it out there. What did Allah say about this in the Quran? Chapter 4, verse 48. This chapter called Women, on nisa Here's what Allah said. He doesn't forgive people setting up partners with Him in worship, but anything else, He can forgive it. So the idea of making partners with Allah in worship, this is the worst thing in this test that we're in. Have you said, well, this is a good person. He's good to you. He's a nice guy, nice to you. But he's not being very nice to Allah. He's not being good to Allah if he made partners with him in worship or denied Allah's ayahs, his proofs. So that's the way I would answer that question, I think. I, if there was any good in that, it was from Allah. Any mistakes, of course, are from myself. Thank you very much for that. On my right side, alhamdulillah. Too much shahada, Sheikh. Hmm? So you, you, you sat down too early. Somebody else wants to do shahada? Yes. On the right oh. side. I'm back. <laughs> What's your name, brother? Leonardo. 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 It's nice to have you with us yes. today. You're wearing a shirt that says, Peace of the World. That's similar to some other countries I've heard that they said they wanted their piece of the world. <laughs> oh, oh, it's spelled different. That's right. Okay, anyhow. It's nice to have you with us today. 
Tente. So, are you ready to accept Islam? Mm. No. Have they, uh, have yes. they explained yes. to you yes, yes, we yes. believe there's only one God? Yes. yes. And Muhammad's his messenger? Yes. yes. Okay. So you repeat after me. Okay. I swear. I swear. I swear. I swear. There's only one God. Uh, only repeat. one God. Yeah, only one, one guy. Yeah. Allah. Allah. And, Allah. And, and, and Muhammad. Muhammad. His messenger. Is the messenger. Perfect. Okay. Now Arabia. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An la ilaha. Allahu ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa. Wa. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. 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 Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Very good. Very good. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Who, who is uh, with our brother? You're with him? He, he understands in his language? Yes. You sure? Yeah, okay. I want to be sure of this. Take good care of him now. Yeah. That's on you now, man. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> well, as long as we're up, anybody else? Who here? I got to stop doing that. Who here? Guys, listen to me. Gals. If you have never done this before, publicly and you're saying to yourself you know I wish I could do that but everybody else is gonna look at me funny do you really care what other people think about you no. do you really care isn't it more important what you think about yourself on the day of judgment and to make it real easy for you all of us who believe in the law already we're gonna get up get up don't make me come down there <laughs> <laughs> if you already believe in the law get up all right. Now, see how much easier it's going to be for you? Nobody's going to hardly notice it. And this is going to work good for all of the Muslims who never made their shahada yet. <clears throat> so all we're going to do now is just tell you, if you really believe there's one God, and you really want to worship Him on His terms, that's your first step. What you do after that, that's up to you. But if you don't believe this, then please sit back down. Because this is not a game. As much as I joke around, this is not a joke. And whoever says this with sincerity in their heart, our prayers are with them that Allah will always guide them, guide them to the very, very best. So if you're ready, stand up now and just repeat this with me. I'm going to have to do English first and then attempt some Arabic. You can go along with me. But remember, it's what's in your heart that counts more than what's coming out of your mouth. So keep it clean and pure for your Allah in your heart. I swear, I swear. There, is no God to there is no God to worship except one God, except one God. Allah. Allah. And I swear, swear. Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. Ashhadu, Ashhadu an la ilaha, ilaha. illa Allah wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Jazakum Allah khair. We had a great time with all of you tonight. And we ask Allah to accept from all of us and all of you. Please, if this is your first time, make shahada like this. You want to get some help. As you leave out of here, they have some gifts for you. As a matter of fact, they're right outside this door. I'm going to be out there checking about that right now. Come out and give us salams before you go. And until we can be together again, my prayers with you. Hope you pray for us for this guidance. Edina. Saratu Mustaqim wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much, Shaykh Yusuf Estes, for his beautiful speech, respected guests, Fadilatul Shiyukh, my brothers and sisters. First of all, I would like to thank the Islamic Affairs and Charitable Activities Department from Dubai for organizing this event, great event, for giving us this platform for allowing for such an event to take place. Thank you. A couple things. There's a few more days left with Sheikh Yusuf. If you want to catch up with him. If you don't feel quite ready today, 
legs were hurting, maybe you didn't want to stand up. You might have another chance, but you might not. There's no guarantee if you leave tonight here that you can make it home. After the fact that God exists, the one true fact that no one can debate over is that we're all going to die. And it can be any time. So I pray to God Almighty that He gives us, He gives you another chance. Think it over, and as Shri Yusuf said, ask God, guide us.